an exciting show about restoration coming up next. During my years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore and create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about design and blurring the lines between inside and out. Now, in today's show, we're going to talk about restoration. It's something that I'm a big fan of. You know, just because something may be tired or looks a little worn, there's no reason to throw it out. Let me give you an example. Right here on this farm, the barn behind me, called the old dairy barn, well, it was in pretty rough shape. But rather than push it away, we decided to give it a facelift. We did things like added some cedar trim, some weather tight windows, and a red metal roof. The exterior was stained a dark brown, and then we also painted the windows lichen green, one of my favorite colors. Then we added traditional wall mounted barn lights, and now it looks as good as new. Now, of course, we don't use it as a milk barn anymore. We use it for storing vegetables like, well, garlic, potatoes, and onions. It's a great place if you want to keep something in a cool, dry, dark place. Also, part of the barn is used for bringing in our eggs from the poultry pens, washing them, storing them. We also keep our incubators and brooders here for in the spring when we're hatching babies. Also in today's show, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine who's in the tile restoration business. You see, he creates these beautiful tiles for the historical market. I'll also show you how to preserve your terracotta containers. Plus, I want to tell you about these octagonal buildings that we've placed in the garden. And a little later, we'll visit an interesting garden in Chicago have you ever been to an antique shop or even a flea market and found something that you just thought, hey, this has got some real value, but it didn't look that great? Well, I found an 1820s chest. It was in really rough shape, but I only paid 50 bucks for it. And I called my friend John Kloss, who's a master at transforming things, and he took this chest and gave it a whole new life. It was really interesting to find a piece this nice and this old and um, find the things that are interesting, like the back is one solid piece of wood, which is really quite unusual to see it in solid wood. And then, of course, it needed a lot of repairs as well. Most of the time, when we get an old piece like this, all the drawers going too far, the dragging down on the bottom, and so what we wind up doing is adding new bottoms or edges here to the bottom of the drawer so that they'll lift back up. You can see where the groove used to sit, where the wood used to run or the nails even scraped through it. So this will lift it back up to the original height. They actually wear out. Either the wood wears out on the drawers or the wood wears out in here. And so what we do is we remove all of the loose items. We take the drawers out and then we uh, strip it, which gets it down to the bare wood. And after we strip it, we sand it, get it as smooth as we want to. We do the repairs that need to be done. And then after the repairs are done, we'll continue with the process that we are going to do, like painting it with a primer, and then with the finish that color that was selected. Something like this is already over 100 years old and it will still be here another hundred years from now. So there is a benefit to getting an old piece. A, you're recycling instead of using new trees to cut up, and B, and you're getting something that has been traditionally used in a family. And most of the pieces that I see are family heirlooms, like I have seen pieces here that belong to great-grandfathers, like I have a sea chest that belonged to someone it's great grandfather and they are redoing it because they wanted to have it in their house. In all projects that I do, it's fun to start and it is really nice to see a piece when it is finished and by the time that I get finished with it and I can see it in his retreat and see how it blends in with the furniture that I have done in the past or that other people have done, it's just really a great job. I enjoy it every day. I, uh, I should be retired but I enjoy my job and I keep doing it. So then hopefully it will blend in well. Just take a look at this outrageous display of orchids. I have a dozen plants in three of these large punch bowls. 
I like to take interesting things like a punch bowl. I bought these at a junk sale where someone had bought out a hotel and had some of these for sale. They were very affordable and I think they look very good across this old sideboard in the front hall. Now I've used Phalaenopsis orchids, sometimes called the butterfly orchid because the bloom looks like a butterfly. And I've used all one color here to create a monochromatic color scheme. So you may say, why Phalaenopsis orchids? Well, they're so readily accessible and available. Plus they last for a long time. You know, these displays will last for three months as long as I take care of them. Now take a look at this, a much more reasonable display, don't you think? Eight stems of orchids, so eight individual pots uh, placed inside this old soup terrain. Again, another secondhand store find. You see these soup terrains come in very handy for displays such as this. And what I did is I just packed them in, pressed some of this moss around the top to serve as a covering. Now you can see I've used white again. Um, I like white because it echoes the color of the woodwork throughout the house, so it's an easy choice. But I use different colors through the seasons. You see, I consider orchids really a 12 month out of the year blooming house plant. And during the holidays, well, they integrate beautifully with all the festive decorations. And when it comes to watering and caring for these plants, I just drop a few ice cubes right around the base of each plant once a week and that's all it takes, and they'll bloom for three months. So how much easier can it get? The style of the house here is Greek Revival, which harkens back to the architectural and cultural history of this region. You see, my goal was to create a cottage that would demonstrate how a traditional looking house could be constructed and maintained using earth-friendly methods. That includes the materials used both inside and out. Brian Bird is a specialist who reproduces tiles that are inspired by the past. He creates these to help with the restoration of historically significant buildings and residences. He tells us more about the process. The business was primarily started to do work for the federal government or government entities that had courthouses or, or libraries or historically significant homes that were trying to be restored. This is a, an existing tile that was sent to me. It's a mortar bed set, uh, probably from about 1904 ni to 1910, uh, th three quarter squares, broken joint. And the uh, customer needed to repair this, so they sent it to me to see if we could possibly make it. And of course, we do make the three quarter inch size. We can also custom match uh, the grout joint size so that he can get a patch without having to repair the, replace the whole floor. Uh, we also do the custom color match work so that we match his colors exactly. You can't tell the original from the new tile. The unglazed porcelain is one of the hardest ceramic materials that there is and you can go into a, a hundred year old uh, installation and there is essentially no wear on the floor. The way we start, uh, a customer will, will send me a, a sample like this, and then we're going to figure out how that tile was made, what color it needs to be, and then we will make a sample, lay it against their original tile, and make sure that it, it's going to be a good match, and we start making tile. Then we're controlling that color all through the firing process. We start with the body preparation, put the, uh, the formulas together for the body for pressing, and then we put on the proper tooling size so that we're pressing the tile exactly the right size. After the tile is pressed, uh, then we fire it to about 2200 degrees Fahrenheit. After the tile is cooled, then we pull that tile from the kills and we mount the tile into repeating sheets uh, so that it can be installed easily. The other part of that mounting process is that we get the grout joints exactly right. We want a pencil rubbing of the original so that we can match up the grout joint size with the original. We make at least 60 different sizes, historical sizes, including penny rounds, hexagons, pentagons, diamonds, uh, everything that we know of that has ever been tried before in mosaics, we have the, the tooling for that. In the mounting process, 
we mount the tile into repeating sheets uh, so that the installer can get the job done without having to place all the tiles in in order. We make all of the inside and outside corners, but this is a good example of a repeating sheet. This is a, a Greek key, which is very classic, and that end of that sheet fits right here, and it just continues and continues and continues until it gets to a corner, and then we make the outside corner or the inside corner to turn that corner and then go down the next wall. I recently made a trip to Chicago where I met up with a friend of mine, Shauna Coronado. She gave me a tour of her very interesting garden where many of the items are recycled. Shauna, I'm enjoying warming myself by the <laughs> fire here on your firebox in your outdoor room. Outdoor room, and here's the thing that's so wonderful about this, all free. I'm a big free cycle person. I so the mantle free, free. furniture free. free. Everything free. And so it's a great way to do sustainable things in the garden. All the comforts of home in the house <laughs> right out here in the garden. You got it. And you know, even though you're here on a busy street, you have this wall and you're so focused on this garden space, uh, this living space, that you Absolutely. don't really even notice the cars passing. Oh no. And it's all about growing vegetables too. I had to find a way to incorporate a living room and vegetables together. Of First course. living room I've ever seen where someone's growing vegetables. <laughs> it works it's for very me. good. Now let's come back to the vegetable gardens in the living room for just a moment. I want to talk about the walls of the room. I love the way that you've decorated the walls with art. It's art, but it's living art. Behind me, you see really a pallet garden, and we've built the pallet garden all from leftover material, sure. including the plants. Yeah. The plants were working, not working in pots that I had, so we pulled them out and repotted them yeah. in this. What would have been a throwaway has now been integrated into this beautiful wall hanging made with a pallet. And I love the way you've created pouches by using plastic to help hold the soil. Absolutely. Beautiful. And the mirrors on the wall. <laughs> yeah. The mirrors are a part of that too. Now if you put a mirror up too high, you have a, there's a risk that birds can get harmed. So I keep them down low. They actually move a little bit on the fence. So I think it's been very safe for them and it's been a wonderful part of this whole living room. And of course in a garden room you have to have an entrance and I love your arbor here. And then you have the path and the wine bottles as a border. Wine bottles. Use them. What we did was put it all along the border of the path, and then it, it's not cemented in. It's yeah. non-permanent, yeah. but a great way to recycle something that everyone has on their counter. I like them on the slight angle. And look at your potager. You have these four beds. Mm -hmm. I love the, the symmetry of it. And you're growing lovely vegetables here in the shade. In the shade. That's a trick. So many people think you can't grow vegetables in the shade, but look, it's happening right here. We have kale, beets, even celery, herbs, society garlic. Everything's here. Look at the basil. And they're planted in beds that are really recycled post-consumer plastic. So I love the idea of reusing, recycling whenever you can, and then growing vegetables in the shade. Everyone has some shade. You got to do it. Sure. Well, I, you know, with as intense as the sun can become during mm -hmm. the summer, you know, the vegetables really like a little relief from it. They do. And lettuces grow great in shade, the Swiss chard. All your leafy thing. It's really beautiful and you've added splashes of color with the coleus, which is nice. It's Further decorating your room. Exactly. And then it's edged all with hostas. Hostas everywhere because of course they love shade. And they're rather drought tolerant. I have no extra watering needs here. It's Let's step over into this room. I see some color on the wall. Oh, my wall garden. Wow, Shauna, you've got the color going on here. This is a great example of another vertical garden. Blue. But look at the color. I love the blue, and here's why I put it up here. I wanted a wall of color that was sustainable. I could plant vegetables in it, and I didn't want to overfill it so that all you saw were plants. Yeah, I love the color. Sure. And of course, I recycled all the old shovels. We have a climbing bean here going mm -hmm. up the side. So it's really mm -hmm. a whole wall of art. I love it. You've got radishes, you've got shard. Look at the mm -hmm. stalks of that shard. Oh, so tall. It resonates with all the other reds here. I, I think it's fantastic. It's planted with all organic soil and it's been doing marvelously. Now tell me, how do you keep something like this water? Is there a little drip system there or do you just stand here and just soak it with the hose? I soak it with a hose, but here's the thing. You need to hit that back wall. If you hit the back wall, that material absorbs the water and it wraps all around the plant. Now these, these pockets are made from recycled, what, plastic bottles? It's true, and it feels like wool when you touch it. 
Amazing. Marvelous, marvelous. And well, easy to maintain. This can stay outside for years and will do just fine. Well, I, I love the fact that you've used both vegetables and flowers in it. So it's not only beautiful, but it's useful. Exactly. Yeah. That's a little touch of heaven. I love the wall. <laughs> well, I just love your creative expression and particularly what you've done throughout this garden on these vertical, often underutilized spaces. Thanks Thank for you. sharing today. Well, thanks for coming. It was wonderful. I don't know about you, but I grow a lot of plants in containers around here. I love container gardening. But one of the things you may want to think about at the end of the season, which I like to do it when I can find the time, or at the beginning of the season, you want to take care of your terracotta pots. And I've got some small ones here just to illustrate what I'm doing. I like to take a bleach solution. And what I've done here is I've taken about a fourth of a cup to five gallons of water of bleach. And you just want to take your terracotta pots and let them soak in this bleach solution for about 30 minutes. And what this does, it allows the water and bleach to get into the pores of your terracotta. Um, you see pathogens can build up in the pores of the terracotta from one season to the next. And what this will do is eliminate those and will ensure that you will have beautiful flowering containers next spring. Then all you do is just take them out and let them just air dry. You can either store them for next spring or if you're doing it in the spring, you can let them dry and then begin to plant them. Now, another thing I want to point out, if you have trouble with a lot of buildup from salts from fertilizer on your terracotta pots, like you can see on this particular container, you can just take something as simple as baking soda and water. You can see I've just created a paste here. Uh, by taking the dry baking soda and just adding a certain amount of water to you get to this consistency. And then what I like to do is just take a, and apply this. You can just use it with your hand and rub it on the container like this. Be generous with it and then just take a sponge and rub the salts off. And the baking soda will neutralize those salts and they'll come right off. So it's a really easy way to get your containers in tip-top shape uh, for the growing season. Give it a try. It's always rewarding to me when I can create a project that comes from rescued or recycled materials. And that's the case with this octagon building. You see, it's in the Greek Revival style, circa about 1830, so it reflects the style of the house itself. Now this octagon and the other one on the west side of the terrace, there's a pair of them, uh, they're eight-sided obviously, and as you can see, uh, almost every side has windows, so the windows play an important role here, and I had to have a lot of windows to make this work. As you can see, the windows are also triple hung, meaning there are three sets of windows that are stacked. That gives you lots of light on the inside of these buildings. And there's a historical precedent for this as well. Luckily, there was a house that was being completely remodeled with lots of windows. And so we were able to take the windows from that house and recycle them and use them in these outbuildings. We also took a lot of the materials that were left over from the construction of the house, saved them, and they went into the construction of these as well. Now I want to point out something that was an inspiration when I went to Mount Vernon. You see, Mount Vernon looks like a stone building, but actually the exterior blocks, if you will, are not stone blocks, but they're actually made of wood. And so the foundation of this building, I wanted to follow that same precedent that George and Martha Washington had back in the mid-18th century. And you see, we took two by 12 boards and beveled them on the side to give the illusion of blocks. So the building looks like it's sitting on a stone or block foundation. And I painted it this dark brown, again, to reflect that solid base for these buildings to rest upon. Now, if you take a peek on the inside, you can see that we're not finished. I have to take these things a step at a time. I do things in phases. But if you look up, I've done a chandelier out of a branch. It's a sumac tree that I cut off and then wrapped it with Christmas lights. It's very festive. And then we had some espalier trees that unfortunately died and I used those to adorn the walls. Haven't quite figured out what to do with the interior, but we're gonna come up with something and you can bet I'll use some recycled materials. Here in my design studio, I love to get pictures that you send to me of your home. 
we play around with some ideas on how to improve them. Now today we've got a great looking Victorian house in Missouri. It belongs to Charles and Terry. And what I love about this is that they say they love flowers of any kind. They particularly like those that are purple, pink, and soft yellow. Now the house faces the south and there's a lot of different things we can do here because there's really basically no foundation planting. So let's just throw out a few ideas. Um, one of the things that I might think about doing is getting some evergreen started first before we start adding a lot of flowers. So if we think about a foundation planting here and here just to accent either side of the entryway and off the corner here I do the same type of plant. You could just do a green velvet boxwood or something really basic. I would come over here and do something taller. Uh, this could be a, a columnar arbovita of some sort, but something that's evergreen. So you can see we've already kind of got an evergreen frame going. You could even bring across here a low holly hedge over to this side of the property with a break in it and a gate, which would give you a place for flower beds here and here. And likewise, on this side, you could take that same arbovita hedge and come all the way down the side over here, and that would give you a place for planting. Now, let's talk about the idea of a picket fence because I think what might be kind of fun here would be to, here's the sidewalk, to bring a picket fence that would run across the front of the house here, here, perfect with this Victorian styled house, only about four feet tall, but you could do an interesting gate here, and then on that fence you could plant all kinds of roses. And right along the edge from the fence over to the sidewalk here be a great place to fill in a low uh, perennial like a uh, catnip that blooms soft lavender and bring that same catnip down the sides of the walk. Um, and there you could add, because you like soft yellows, a wonderful daylily, one called Going Bananas, which is one of those varieties that continues to bloom throughout the season. Now, speaking of blooming continuously, a long blooming shrub is the limelight hydrangea. And you could put some limelight hydrangeas here on this side between the hedge and this arbovita, or even on this corner of the house. And I would come over here with some limelight hydrangea here as well. Now, let's talk trees for just a moment because there's an opportunity here, I think, to do something like a pink flowering dogwood. And over here on this side, you could do the same or even a weeping cherry that blooms pale pink, which would be really beautiful. Now to finish it off, the foundation planting could be very simple here. You could continue with a collection of flowers, but I would rather you go with something that's evergreen, maybe just a ground cover such as a winter creeper and issue all of the flowers, the purple cone flowers, more daylilies, phlox, all those great, wonderful old fashioned flowers, including peonies to the flower beds over here and across the front of this hedge here. You have a wonderful house here and a beautiful backdrop for a great garden. And I'm happy you love all kinds of flowers because this garden could be spectacular. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed our emphasis on restoration and recycling things. Hey, just because it looks bad doesn't mean you can't give it a new life. Until next time from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at plnsmith.com.